Every person that you meet is fighting a battle that you cannot see. You've probably heard this saying before, and it's very true. So every single one of us, at some point of our lives, we encounter something that might be difficult to communicate. Let's illustrate that just for a moment. So this is us here today in this theater. And let's say that for a moment we represent all Canadians. Let's picture one type of a battle that is very invisible and a lot of people can't see it. Chronic disease. So 60% of Canadians have one. Now let's try another one. Invisible disability, 14% of Canadians have one. And that could be something that's physical, it could be mental. Regardless, as the name states, it's invisible, we can't see it, yet it's there. And this is just one example. There's so many more things that go on in people's lives, day in and day out, that we have a difficult time communicating and often listening to. So I ask you, What's a story that you've always wanted to tell? Perhaps you know right away. Perhaps you're not quite sure yet. For me, my own story has actually transformed how I approach my work and my life. So I am one of the 14% of Canadians who has an invisible disability. And in this case, it's called ankylosing spondylitis, or AS. Sounds like a very exotic disease, but uh, the truth is it's just as frequent as rheumatoid arthritis, which a lot of people are familiar with, and it is a type of inflammatory arthritis. So our short definition is the body is attacking itself and there's no cure. And it also happens to happen to people right in the prime of their life between age 15 and 35. So right when you're trying to figure out who you are as a person, go to school, maybe start a career, start a family, this happens. And for most people, it's just an aspect of their life that they battle and they move forward. But it doesn't make it any easier to communicate to anybody else. So when I do try and describe to people what I might need on a given day, even if they know me very well, perhaps they're a stranger, I often get frequent responses from them. They sound something like this. Are you sure? Young people don't get arthritis. Well, you're way too young. You're too female. Only men get that kind. Oh, uh, my back hurts sometimes too. You just need to exercise more and build up your core. Are you sure this isn't something that you're just imagining, like in your head, because you look, you know, normal? Maybe you just wanted sick leave to get an extended holiday. My personal favorite. My auntie's cousin's stepfather's best friend cured this by going paleo. <laughs> but... The most common one is, you look fine. And I do. This is what AS looks like. This is a competitive athlete. This is me, my teens, performing at my best, on my best days. Of course, you don't see the bad days because I didn't want anyone to see them. And that continued into adulthood. This is me as an adult picking the most empowering activity that I could find because I wanted to not just prove to myself that I was strong, but I wanted other people to know, too, that I was as strong as I wanted to be and that my illness did not, absolutely did not define me as a person. But it didn't make it easier to communicate as the years went on. As a child, I might say, hey, I, I can't go and hang out with you guys today. I'm just not feeling it. And my friends would give me this funny look of, okay, you know, I'm not sure what's going on with her. And as an adult, I say the same thing. I say, hey, you know, I, I can't um, join you on the craft brewery tour because I just realized all the venues have these hard wooden benches, and if I sit on those for several hours, it could leave me regretting it for days to come, so I might just skip. So it's, it's, it's interesting because not only do I have a condition that sounds like an extinct dinosaur and like something somebody in their 70s might have because I'm neither a dinosaur, <laughs> nor am I in my 70s. But I had to find a way to try and communicate to people so that they might be able to understand. And that's, that was on me to have to do. And I thought for a while there as a youth, well, you know what? A machine can do this. What if we could just invent a machine and it could help somebody understand what I experienced? I can, it can help me help them understand. I thought that was a really cool idea. 
But it's also a bit of a cop-out because each and every one of us has something called a worldview, and that's a lens in which you see your life through. And like any lens, it can be as narrow or as wide as you make it to be. So my lens is not going to be the same as your lens and vice versa. So I thought, well, why can't we just, you know, communicate and talk to one another? Can't that just work? Why do we need a machine to do that for us? But the truth is we're not really great at communicating. You know, we're not great at listening as children, but as we get older, we think we know a lot about the world. We've developed this worldview, and we tend to interpret what people are saying in a way that makes sense to us. And it might not actually be what they're trying to say. So maybe there is some sort of technology or communication style that might work when words fail. And I did find, like so many others must find, that at times words just, they fail, they don't serve you. So I had this aha moment. About 15 years ago, I entered something called virtual reality installation. And I put a headset on, and using just my breathing and basic movements back and forth in space, I was able to levitate to the very top branches of a tree and descend below ground into the root system. And it was as beautiful as it was profound because I realized communication can be very subtle and maybe we don't actually always need words. Maybe technology can actually help to expand our worldviews. So this actually changed the shift and the course of how I actually work with artistic practice and my scientific practice. This is virtual reality. So how it actually works is you have your immersive virtual environment and you have your physical environment and you're in both at the same time. So your mind and your body believe what is happening is real. So that's very, very profound. You're actually there. The things that you do in that virtual environment actually have ramifications for you. This is also virtual reality. This is a VR installation that we created at Simon Fraser University in which you wear the headset and just using your body to move in the direction that you want to go. You don't even need your hands. You simply exist. So this light comes and it takes you on a journey from this forest where you're alone, eventually into outer space where you see Earth. And afterwards, maybe you feel like the world is huge and you're just one person on it. And maybe there's a lot of people out there like you. So that's the research that we do, is to look at how awe and wonder might be able to facilitate feelings of connectedness. That sounds profound. It's because it is. Turns out that VR can actually facilitate pro-social behavior. It can create pro-environmentalist behavior. It can help people to internalize and learn from one another. And this was actually in the case of med students, learning from their patients. It can create perspective shifts. So seeing the world in a way that you actually hadn't seen before. Of course, as we're finding, people might just feel connected through immersive awe. It cannot be described. It must be experienced. This is something people say about the immersive realities after they try it. Try talking about something that your body went through. It's very difficult to do, using, again, just words. But this saying is often said as it relates to empathetic understanding. It must be experienced. So creating empathetic understanding, how might you do that with a story that you want to tell? I ask you, because maybe the first thing that pops into mind is a story that you've been wanting to tell for a long time, or perhaps your story is still being written. This is something artists for centuries have been asking. How can I tell my story in the best way that other people might understand? And this has actually been done in immersive realities for quite some time. In 1992, Rita Addison, an artist, was involved in an accident that left her with a traumatic brain injury. So Rita went through a very difficult recovery process. And at the end of it, she met with a group of individuals who were like her, had brain injuries. And she finally realized just how isolating that whole experience was for her. And she decided to do something about it. So she called on her skills as an artist and using technology she never even touched before, virtual reality, she created Detour, 
brain reconstruction ahead, an immersive environment that showed people what it's like to recover from a brain injury. And people walked out with their worldview completely transformed as to what they thought the experience would be like. And there's other experiences like this that are being developed every single day, not just in research labs too, but from people who are just like ourselves. In 2015, I created a venue called VR Village at an annual conference called SIGGRAPH for computer graphics professionals. And the purpose was to create a home for these types of experiences. So they're not just about tech. They're not about entertainment and gaming. Definitely not only about that. They're about how we might connect to one another and how we might use the technology to tell stories and create experiences that we've actually never seen before. Because it should be noted that we're in a really exciting time. This is a huge shift that's happening. This technology has never been more accessible than it is right now. In the same way that the internet made information and knowledge accessible, the DSLR cameras that everybody uses and your mobile phones have made photography and documentation accessible. Well, the immersive realities are making experiences accessible. And in order to be successful at doing this, we need as many diverse voices and actions involved as possible. So I prompt every single one of you to actually go out and try something. So you might be thinking, well, how, in fact, do I do that? Isn't that difficult? Don't I need a lot of technical know-how? Or maybe I need to be an artist. But the truth is, having now experienced close to 1,000 virtual reality installations in close to three years, there's two traits in particular for the ones that succeed the best at connecting people to one another and creating this sense of empathetic understanding. Those two traits are authenticity and co-creation. So what do I mean by authenticity? It's pretty straightforward. The idea is that you stay true to the origin of the story that you want to talk about. So what does that actually mean? Well, maybe let's look at an example of something that's not authentic. This is a disability simulator the act of blindfolding somebody so that they might have trouble doing an impossible task like shooting a bow and arrow. This isn't authentic because for an individual who is blind, they might actually have no trouble doing this at all. They've built up a lifetime of skills and abilities. And these experiences are now known not to create empathetic behavior. They don't succeed at doing that. So what might we try instead? We can learn from somebody named John Hull. Now, John was interesting. When he found out that he was going blind, he started taking audio recordings of the experience. <coughs> and he wanted people to understand what it might be like to live in a world beyond sight. That's how he put it. His world didn't stop when he became blind. So he teamed with a group of virtual reality creators about three years ago to create Notes on Blindness VR to show people and help them experience what it might be like to develop these multi-sensory abilities just like he did. So that's an excellent idea. Next, co-creation. What does that mean? Well, that last example actually was pretty good at telling you what co-creation might be because here you have a storyteller who needs to tell their narrative and you have a team who've got the skills that can help them do that. That's what co-creation is. And the truth is, like any communication medium, it takes an entire village to create it. But what's interesting is in the immersive realities, co-creation can actually mean one more thing. And it's that the narrative doesn't have to be linear A, B, C in sequence. A narrative can actually be generated through the experience itself, and not just by one people, but by multiple people. So the story can keep on going. This is Dream Makers. This is an experience that was at VR Village's past year. And how it works is you have one person who has a tablet. Essentially, it's a recipe book full of what you need for ingredients to create dreams. So that person goes, and they actually distribute those ingredients to the person who's in the VR headset. That person must then gather up the ingredients, combine them together, and only then can the dreams be made reality. So only by working together can these two people create this experience. And it's going to be unique for every single person who goes through it. The other beautiful thing about this is they may never meet. It doesn't matter what gender they are, what age they are, what their backgrounds are, what their skill level is. 
they could just be there and they could work together and create their own story together. So I encourage you to step inside an immersive environment and contemplate the experience that you've had. So how might you go on to use a technology to tell a story that you've been wanting to tell and maybe have been at a loss for words to do so? Because never before has this technology ever been so affordable and accessible as it is right now. And the truth is, the experiences that we create that end up out there in the public, they need diverse voices and they're only going to be as good as we make them. And that's us. Thank you very much.